Taking in the sights, Justin.、Mm. Taking in the sights.、Mm. The immortal words tweeted by Watford less than two hours before kickoff, paired with a video of a dreary looking Luton. A tweet which doesn't look the cleverest in hindsight now, does it? Hindsight. Yes, that is the key word here. Hindsight. Just don't give, don't give your opposition a little bit of motivation.、Mm. You know, just. Play it cool. Have a little bit of a prod. Have a little bit of a joke. But that was like as soon as that was posted, I was like, "You're losing this game. There is no way you come back from this. You have to win. You have to win." And none of the players, bless them, bless their little hearts, would have been aware of that pressure that was put on them、um, by their social media team at, at Watford. Yeah. Yeah, brave, very brave. Karma is a cruel mistress. <laughs> is, is old karma,、um, and then of course Luton obligatory put out a tweet later on saying taking in the sights,、um, which was Jordan Clark celebrating. I think it was. But look, if Watford were taking in the sights, then the, mo- the most beautiful sight of all was seeing that big, gorgeous smile of Rob Edwards because we haven't seen it in a while. However, Justin, and he'll be absolutely delighted with this. Not just because. It was against their big rivals, of course. Not just because he was under pressure, but also because Luton were brilliant. Yeah, they were fantastic. They really were fantastic. And I think, you know, it wasn't a case of them being particularly groundbreaking or playing beautifully sexy football. They just looked fired up. It looked like they had their edge back.、Um, I think that's the best thing you can take away from the game. And they made look they made Watford look very uncomfortable. You know, Carlton Morris, for example. I think the, the the biggest thing to take away from that is is how involved Carlton Morris was in the small physical battles with defenders, just making it a horrible, horrible game for them. And I think you know, especially in the Championship, you don't need to be playing like a Leeds, like a Burnley, where you're trying to pass teams off the park. You've just got to get in opposition faces. Make it awful and horrible, and hit the basics, and you give yourself a very good chance of winning. And that's all Luton did in this game. Didn't do anything groundbreaking. It wasn't a tactical thing. They just hit the basics, and they got in the faces of Watford. And I think it really, really paid dividends. Yeah, Carter Morris was certainly helped by some of the most atrocious marking I think I've ever seen <laughs> for、uh, the Luton second goal. I, I think Watford were going for zonal marking, but. Instead, they left Colton Morris, one of the best players in the air in the division, with a completely free header a yard out from goal. So it didn't work out very well, whatever they were trying to do. But look, the scoreline does a lot of the talking here, and it was a very fair reflection of the game. Luton were excellent, the best performance of the season by a country mile. Although that's not admittedly a very high bar so far this season, but it, it was completely different to what we've seen so far. They looked like the Luton of a couple of seasons ago. Didn't they? That's something that we've said quite a lot. That Luton haven't been playing like we know Luton can be playing. They are outworking the other team, not just trying cross after cross. And it was so impressive. I think Carlton Morris coming back was a big thing because he's such a handful. Alfie Doherty was immense, and the midfield ran the game.、Mm-hmm. It was very, very impressive. And they often say derbies come down to whoever wants it more. It certainly looked, from a neutral perspective, that one team wanted it much more than the other. We'll come on to、uh, the Watford side of things very shortly. But this could be a big moment in Luton season, Justin. Couldn't it? Wins like this can sometimes spark a team into life, and they'll certainly hope that's the case here, won't they? Definitely, definitely. I know we've been over, you know, fairly critical of Luton in recent weeks leading up、uh, to this game. But I think it's all been justified because, as you point out, they have been really poor. But this game really was,、um, you know, an insight in what Luton can do and what they have been doing in the past and, and what they should be doing going forwards. And it has to be, it has to be a catalyst for them. Them pushing once again. They were clinical, obviously in front of goal, both in their own,、uh, you know. Um, area and in、uh, Watford's area as well, and I think you know combining those elements、um, and, and taking that forward, and again getting the confidence back and the belief back. I think that's the big thing: the belief in that they are a good side. I think that will, yeah, this sort of win against a local rival, you know, a local rival in Watford that have been very, very you know, good this season. They've been you know, very much, a, you know, I won't say in playoff contention, but they've been batting up the, the the top of the table. Whereas Luton have been struggling. You know, looking at this game in isolation, you wouldn't have. Yeah, thought Watford were in the top half and in the bottom half. It was, you know, tables were turned massively, and as you say, Luton need to use this as a as a as a foundation going forward. Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely right. As it's got to be said as well, Luton's games up to the end of November 
are very tricky. They've got Sunderland in midweek, which is a big game, but then they've also got coming up West Brom, Middlesbrough, Leeds and Norwich. So it would be very, very difficult to build up some form, but they're more than capable of doing it because this Luton team is very good. They haven't shown it so far, but we know that they are very good. It's one of the strongest teams in the league, isn't it? So Mm -hmm. if they do build up a head of steam, then they've got nothing to fear. I just hope that this isn't a false storm where the players were really up for it because it was a derby and then revert to what they were doing previously. I, I think that's unlikely, but it's not impossible. Whatever the case, if they take how they played against Watford into their next games, then... They'll definitely keep getting results without a doubt. Um, On Thursday, Justin, Tom Cleverley said he wanted to inflict more pain (laughs) on Luton. (laughs) Didn't go uh, very well, that, did it? Yeah, I was was going to bring that quite up. And I think, to be fair, he said to himself, um, to local radio after after the game, that they're going to take a lot of criticism coming their way and they're going to have to take it on their chin. And, you know, absolutely right. They've done a lot of talking heading into this, probably a little bit too much. You know, Watford have started better than Luton, but... They, I think it has put a lot of pressure on themselves and they, they really didn't turn up in this game. They really, it was a poor display. There was not a lot of energy. It felt like it lacked massively and they just couldn't match Luton's, um, you know, Luton's quality and Luton's you know, desire to win the game. And, uh, when you, you know, giving it the big and pre-game, you've got to back it up or your team's got to back it up and they did not. No, they didn't. And I think it is worth mentioning Watford's away record is becoming a bit of a concern. Four straight losses now and they've lost each of the last three by three goals. And then uh, they've got the small matter of Leeds away on Tuesday night. So <laughs> good luck there, lads. Uh, but the, uh, the the lack of fight in this game was really poor. Unless Watford are involved in something coming the end of the season. Their games against Luton are the biggest of the season, aren't they? Yeah. Let, let, let's get straight out to facts. Someone... Really could have let the players know that though, because the scoreline speaks for itself here. I think, I think Luton, uh, I think the, these two could be playing right now, and I'm not sure Watford would have scored based off how poor they were in this one. One team was clearly more up for it than the other, which is surprising because it is a derby. And oh, Tommy Clevs will be hoping that this isn't a sign of things to come because it seems like their results are starting to average, average themselves out a bit, aren't they, Justin? Yeah, yeah. I think that's the, the key worry. Uh, I think there's probably a little bit of. Um, you've got to be cautious with Watford because they they start they have to start the season really well. But as you say, the, the results, recent results anyway, they will start to average themselves out because the squad is lacking quality. You know, I've seen a lot of Watford fans really sort of get frustrated. You know, this game against Luton is probably a good example of the, the difference in quality between the two sides. Luton are very, very good pack full of quality. Watford have got quality in parts, but it's not flowing through the team like it is at Luton. Um, I know it's quite, you know, people will pull up and say, well, you know, Watford in the top half in around the playoffs, Luton aren't. You know, it's a confidence thing, I think, with Luton. It will start to play out, whereas with Watford, probably have been outperforming, you know, chances, you know, chances created, chances succeeded, et cetera. And as you say, law of averages tells you sometimes, yeah, they will, they will level out. On Friday night, Sheffield United's unbeaten start came to an end after losing 2 0 away at Leeds. Let's have some three bird reviews for Leeds. Rich Lay on our Patreon says, A. Oh, let's go. Callum says, a best in league. Uh, Darren says, piece of cake. <laughs> a big result for Leeds, Justin. A big, a big result. But just how big are we talking right now? I think you've got to, you know, without getting too carried away, I say that. Um, I think it, it throws a statement out to the rest of the division because Leeds looked really, really good. They controlled the game and they were relatively comfortable in how they dictated the game. And that's coming up against a team who... I've had six clean sheets in a row. They're unbeaten in the, uh, well, in, in, the only unbeaten team in the entire FAL coming in, in, into this game, Sheffield United. Um, so to put a team to the sword with relative ease, I think, um, despite it being only a 2-0 scoreline and 1-0 up until the 90th minute when Matteo Joseph scored, I think it's a big, big statement win. And I think, again, with Leeds, it's going to breathe a lot of confidence back into that team because you know, performance has dropped off a little bit for the international break, but to come out of the international break and get a win against a promotion rival, yeah, huge confidence boost and a quality win, quality performance as well to match. Yeah, Justin, you basically said exactly what I've got written down here. <laughs> Statement win for Leeds. I think the amount of jubilation and joy after after the final whistle pretty much shows how big this felt for Leeds because, look, they're facing one of the best teams in the league and dominated them, really. Not in the, not in the way of they should have scored more, but in terms of how they managed and controlled yeah. the game. The, the only frustration really was that it took so long for them to score the first goal. Yeah. Um, 
it wasn't really a case of them missing loads of chances. It, it was about making their dominance count. And they eventually got the breakthrough with their first goal directly from a corner since February of this year, which is pretty insane for a side as good as Leeds, isn't it? But that was the case. And a statement win because they faced the team who had won more points than any, than any other so far this season. But it's a statement win because they've faced the team who had won more points than any other so far this season and made them look so second best, mm -hmm. like distantly second best, didn't they? And th this is what they can do. This is what we know Leeds are capable of. We just want to be seeing it every week, don't we? Yeah, I think there's, there'll, there'll probably be an element of, uh, you know, a bit of a sigh of relief because it's uh, you, you can easily become sort of, frustrated uh when you're not winning games when you're not playing well but i think this this performance will probably reassure a lot of people around leeds players management coaches owners fans that they actually they are a very good team they are a very good team they are they have a very good manager in daniel farker who knows what he's doing at this level and they've got a very good group of players to do it i'll perhaps argue as well that you know this high performance will be very hard to replicate every week so i think seeing them win when they aren't playing well is probably more important than you know seeing them win when they're playing as, as good as this because i think what it, this game showed is that if they do play like this they're going to get a win because they've got the quality to to put a team to bed a team as good and you know brilliant defensively as Sheffield united are so it's when those moments come up when they're not playing particularly well that's where they got to turn a game around in their favour, which they struggled to do before the international break. So, you know, that's where we need to see Leeds transform a little bit. But this performance, if they re replicate this every week, they'll bloody blitz the 106. But I'm not saying they will. <laughs> but if they play like this, they will. But they're not going to play like this every week. Yeah, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, the, the, the thing with Leeds is when they haven't been playing well, they, stick, they haven't been getting the results, have they? Which is something that you know, all good teams do. But the most important thing for Leeds is consistency, which is a very simple thing to say. But you look at Sheffield United, for example, Sheffield United haven't been amazing so far this season, but they've been ticking over very nicely and have won, well, had won more points than any other team in the division. Um, and every title winning team we've seen while doing this podcast has been, has had a prolonged spell of blowing teams away, haven't mm -hmm. they? And Leeds need that to happen at some point soon. And maybe that will be now because we saw last season that they can just click all of a sudden. <laughs> I mean, that spell around the new year was the sort of stuff you see from a promotion winning team. And that would have been the kind of thing that helps see you actually go up in most seasons. We need Leeds to kind of do that again, really. But they're more than capable of doing it or going on that sort of run because they've got easily the strongest squad in the league. And, yeah. you know, Moments like the Meslier debacle against Sunderland don't help with that. But they could very very, well, very easily see that run start now because you look at Leeds' next six games, phew, should be pissing them, really. So <laughs> we'll see. But, the curse. Well, I mean, Justin, if you, feel free to have a look at their fixtures coming up because I, I struggle to see how Leeds should be slipping up there. You are right, but that's where Leeds can come unstuck sometimes. It's the games where they should be winning with relative by ease. By leading themselves. By fully leading themselves, by falling apart, Leeds style, so to speak. They need to say those words. I didn't. That's, that's too far. It's it's just like paper. Come on now. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, I think the bottom line is we could be looking back at this Leeds win as the moment where they really start kicking on. I, I do think it is that big a result for Leeds. Um, but look, for Sheffield United, the unbeaten run has come to an end. It's the first time they've conceded a goal in over 11 hours of football, which is bloody impressive, isn't it? But it's their first real setback of the season. So it's going to be interesting to see how they respond, Justin, after facing this setback. It's the big test, isn't it? It really is. Look, Leeds were brilliant. If you catch Leeds on a really good day like they did here, it's going to be a tough one for you. And I think you always expect that a little bit when you go to Ellen Road. Um, and Chris Wilder admitted post game that Leeds were the better side. Sheffield United just looked second best all evening. Not quite a sharp. Second balls, for example, going a miss. Um, barely got out of the half at, uh, the half at times as well. It was just that type of game where if you're not on it, where if you don't match your opposition, you're going to find it a real, real struggle. And just Sheffield United didn't. Um, I think the only thing you can take positives from is it, you know, they, they kept Leeds at bay for a long time in the game. They really did. But they just didn't have enough quality, enough enough drive going forwards to to get something themselves. And you know, as soon as Leeds scored, you sort of you knew that the three points were staying at Ellen Road. So I think, yeah, you're right. It's a big test for Chris Wilder on this side. But I, there are some positives to take out of it, not to be too harsh, because <laughs> that screenshot that went out on the on the second tier Twitter page, for example, of 
Wilder looking very, very displeased. It was genuinely <laughs> probably one of the funniest things I've seen for a while. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I could be of a service. But <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I, it is funny with Sheffield United. I find them to be a bit of a strange beast because they have so much talent in their ranks, don't they? Like, I genuinely don't think the Sheffield United team on paper is that far off the Leeds team. I mean, Leeds have a load more depth, but in terms of the starting eleven, there's so much talent in that Sheffield United team, but they don't really utilise it as well as I think they should. Because, well, I mean, I, I'm no, I'm talking about a side who who were unbeaten in nine games prior to this. But as I said before the international break, the fixtures have been relatively kind for Sheffield United, and every team, every time I've seen them, they're not controlling games that well, even in their wins against much poorer opposition than them, it sometimes feels like they're clinging on to a game. So I, I don't know. I, I'd like to see a bit more from Sheffield United. I mean, it's not bad, is it? Because unbeaten in nine, incredible defensive record. But the fixtures, it's got to be said, are really stiffening up for them now. So I'm very interested to see how they get on from this stage because I feel like this is going to be a proper acid test for where Sheffield United's ambitions will lie this season. It's worth mentioning there were tributes to George Baldock at this game in Sheffield United's first match since his passing. The two captains laid flowers. There was a minute's silence. There were banners. It was very moving and Sheffield United will next be at home next weekend. So there'll be more commemorations to come uh, marking that. Let's go to one of the more eye-catching results of the weekend. Cardiff City 5, Plymouth Argyle 0. Yeah, um, three word reviews from Cardiff fans. Ninian Slopalekith on our Patreon says, Five star show. DJ Macker says, Was that us? Punk on our Patreon says, Reuben Colwell, baby. For Plymouth, Kieran on our Patreon says, They've scored again. Matt on our Patreon says, Away woes again. Rog says, Embarrassed on Sky. Yeah. Quite a surprising scoreline, not only because Cardiff fans gave a mixed reaction to the reports that Omar Ritza would be staying on as caretaker boss um, for the time being, but also because Cardiff had only scored four goals in nine <laughs> prior to this. <laughs> so they've doubled their goal tally for the season in one game, Justin. I, I think it's worth pointing out that since Omar Ritza did has taken charge, they have been a lot better going forwards. You know, you even go to that Hull defeat where they were absolutely battered at the, well, it's not the KC anymore, but away at Hull. Um, they created a, you know, a good amount of chances and they probably should have got one or two and maybe made the, made the game a little bit more difficult for, for Hull, but they didn't. Um, so I think a result like this has probably been coming under, under Risa despite him not being in charge for very long or caretaker charge for very long. I'd say but, a result like this has perhaps been coming, but maybe not the scoreline. Just maybe not, the normally, score not a scoreline. Maybe a 3 0 or a 4 0. Um, but a 5 0 and complete domination that, you know, they really, really made Plymouth look. Like, they, like Sheffield Wednesday did on the opening day. Plymouth was terrible. Um, but I think Cardiff made them look terrible as well. And also, I think it, it's a good highlight of what quality this Cardiff side does possess. There are some good players or some really good attacking players in this team. And I think if Reza can continue getting that blend, then yeah, they, they, they can push, they can push at the table. Yeah, well, a lot of their players who have struggled so far this season all seem to click at once in this one game, didn't <laughs> yeah, they? Because yeah. the likes of Callum Robinson, Ruben Colwell, Chris Willock even got in on the act as well, and when he when he came on, and uh, and while Garzi as well, it was just all seemed to just seemed like everyone was saving everything for this one game for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but look, it hadn't, it hadn't really been like they were missing chances in the previous games. They they were just creating very little in general, and then they exploded into life here. Their finishing was exceptional. <laughs> It was absolutely remarkable. I don't think Dan Grimshaw in the Plymouth goal could have really done anything about <laughs> any of the goals. It was it's complete night and day to what we had seen for the most part from Cardiff City so far this season. They were, of course, helped by Ibrahim Sissoko being sent off in the first half for a big show-like choke slam. Uh, quite a funny exchange, actually, between Sissoko, who was angry after Perry NG smashed the ball at him while he was on the yeah, ground. NG knew what he was doing. Yeah, I, th <laughs> I think he may have had a slight inkling. But then Sissoko got up, did the choke slam, got sent off, which maybe was a bit harsh in all seriousness, I thought. You can't choke slam people in football pitches nowadays, right? Well, I suppose. But, but then woke. Ollie Tanner got in his face and started waving him off the pitch, <laughs> which is uh, the sort of stuff I really enjoy. Um, the score was 2-0 at that stage, I should point out. So it wasn't like Cardiff were gifted the win um, after that sending off. But they were great. And one player in particular was fantastic. Ruben Colwell, baby, Justin. Yeah. 
so often someone who's flattered to deceive and given us a fair bit of frustration over the years, I think that's fair to say, but Mm -hmm. he was exceptional here. He was fantastic. And I will admit that every time I've seen him so far this season, albeit, you know, three or four occasions, he has impressed me. He has looked like the brightest spark in his Cardiff team. And I think, um, you know, what this game shows is he's got the, I won't say the maturity, but he's certainly got the, like he can handle the weight on his shoulders. I think that's the, the, been the thing with him. There's been a lot of, of expectation on him. And it just feels like this game was maybe a bit of a coming of age game for him where it's like, okay, we know he's got the quality, but can he handle the pressure? And, and he did. He did that. And he was at the heart of, you know, all the good positive things going forwards for Cardiff. Um, and I think, you know, the, the key for him is replicating those performances. It's hard for a younger atta- attacker to do it, but that's the difference with, you know, the ones that really do go on to excel and the ones that sort of eventually drop down in divisions. I think Cole's got all the technical quality in the world. It's that mindset that he's got to try and adopt and the ruthlessness he had in this game, he's got to keep, keep, um, keep pushing on with it. Yeah, and we've been waiting a long time for him to really kick on, haven't we? Mm. We, when he first burst onto the scene, must be about four seasons ago. A long time. We heard, yeah, yeah, it was quite a long time ago. We heard a lot about how promising a talent he was, and really being hyped up quite a lot by Cardiff and the Wales national team as well, actually. And what he's had plenty of moments, hasn't he? But he's never followed it up whenever he's produced. So Cardiff fans have been wanting him to make that step up because he is one of their own. But managers have never really seemed to trust him. So hopefully this is the moment where he kicks on. And if Omar Ritsu is the man who gets the best out of him, that'll be a massive tick next to his name with regards to him getting the Cardiff job full time, won't it? So I just hope it's not another case where Ruben Carwell has a great game and then does nothing for the next five because that has happened a few times over his short career. But this was an example of what he can do because he was at the heart of everything here for Cardiff. Mm-hmm. He he really did inspire this fantastic performance and hopefully we do see more of it in the coming weeks. So Cardiff off the bottom of the table for the first time this season now um, after um, for actually for the first time since the second game of the season I should say um, that's how much they've been struggling but look Plymouth's away games Justin proving to be a huge problem for them aren't they? Just one point on the road so far from five games only scored once as well Far from ideal, is it? Well, it's, it, it can be the difference maker between a team staying in the championship and a team dropping down. When you're so poor away from home, um, you've got to really rely on your home form. Look, Plymouth's home form has been positive. Um, but I think Plymouth, you know, the way they set up, the way, well, actually, you know, the way Wayne Rooney sets his teams up away from home, just, I don't know, mentality wise, it just, it just isn't there. It's, it's really hard to put your finger on it because he's a, he's a way record as a manager is terrible. It's dreadful. <laughs> um, and it, it's just one of those things like, how do you, how do you resolve that? How do you become a good away side? Um, when you look at it, you know, Carlos Corbin, for example, you know, keeps his teams very resolute, very difficult to break down. I don't think this Plymouth team is. I don't think it is at home either, but I think that's what makes a team better away from home is, is their ability to, to keep opposition at bay. I just don't think this Plymouth side's got it in them to, to do that, unfortunately. Yeah. It, it is strange that Rooney, in the three clubs he's been at now in England, he has struggled with uh, dealing with away games, which surely you would have figured that out every time. But his record is astonishingly poor, yeah. isn't it? So you're right. It, it's all well and good being solid at home. But if you are just hopeless away from home, then that could be something that sends you down no matter how good your home form is. So, yeah, it's something they've desperately got to sort out. But based off games like this, it doesn't look like it's going to get sorted out anytime soon. So, uh, yeah, definitely something to work on for Wayne Rooney's boys. It's now time for us to check out how our second tier bet builder and multiple with SBK got on, which included our game of the week, as well as just in the nice two bankers from Friday. Our bet builder was on Leeds versus Sheffield United and a £10 stake, Justin was due to return 80 quid. We had Larger Amazoni to have a shot on target, which was a winner. Leeds under 2.5 cards, another winner, because they only had one. Under 3.5 goals, another winner. Sheffield United, double chance. Ah, shit. Yeah. Uh, Final hurdle for us on that one. And you'll be glad to know, this is how it went with our multiple. A £10 stake on our multiple was due to return £110. We had Luton, Sunderland and Sheffield United, double chance. Bugger. <laughs> really regret that Sheffield United pick because <laughs> that's cost us on both. We were just one off on both of our selections, Justin. That was one of the more convincing picks as well because of the form going into this game. But as he tells you, form, form's complete bullshit. 
I, I wasn't sure. I thought I thought the Friday game was a very difficult one to predict. She, Leeds can just turn it on, can't they? Yeah, yeah. But I just thought because Sheffield United were unbeaten and Leeds were odds on favourites, I was I was happy to go against Leeds in that one. But look, they turned it on and uh, made mugs of Sheffield United in the end, didn't they? And made mugs of us with our selections. But we will be back with our next round of picks in this coming Friday's preview show with S. BK. It's now time to reveal the winner of our latest edition of Jameson's Weekend Hero. Every single week we're asking you to nominate a fellow championship fan that you believe deserves recognition. It could be someone who drove you to a recent away day. It could be a friend or relative who got you into supporting your club in the first place. Whatever it is, we want to find out. So to nominate your Jameson Weekend Hero from this weekend, send us a voice note now on WhatsApp explaining your nomination. The number is in the show notes. And of course, if we pick you, you'll win a bottle of delicious Jameson to share with your winner. But on to this week's nomination, we've got this message from Dan, who wants to nominate AD. I'd like to nominate my dad, AD, who is a massive Derby fan like myself. Um, like many football fans up and down the country, my dad got his love for Derby County through my granddad, who lived about 100 yards from the baseball ground and used to, to sneak into most games each week through the turnstiles, over the fences, ducking and diving. Um, but my dad and I, these days, we go to, go to Pride Park as valid season ticket holders. <laughs> Um, have done that for around 15 years together um, and when I was even younger than that um, my dad always always sorted me out made sure I went to um, went to as many games as possible first game being Bradford uh, at home in the late 90s um, and we've traveled down to Wembley on the occasions that Derby have, have been there as well so massive shout out to my dad AD and up the Rams. Up the Rams. There you go. I like that. I'm, I'm loving these these uh, nominations, Justin, which are increasingly about, you know, father and son just enjoying their trips to the football. It's quite hot warming, actually, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's lovely. It's lovely. I mean, I, you know, I, I nominated my dad because he got me into, into football, got me into Derby County, much to my own detriment. But... It's still been a good stead in this time and it's, you know, it's created a passion and a love uh, in that football club. But yeah, you know, kudos to Dan as well for outing his granddad for being a, uh, a know, scoundrel. A scoundrel, <laughs> yeah. Well, there we go. Well, let's raise a glass of Jameson Ginger and Lime to AD, a very worthy winner of this weekend's Jameson Weekend Hero Quick Swig. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Beautiful as always. And remember, you can nominate your Jameson Weekend Hero right now by sending us a voice note on WhatsApp. The number is in the show notes, so just 60 seconds explaining your nomination. And you'll be in with a chance of winning a bottle of Jameson. You must be over 18 to enter, UK only, and T's and C's apply. Let's get on to some more action from the past weekend then. And Portsmouth finally got their first victory of the season by winning 2-1 away at QPR. A much-needed win for Pompey and their players celebrated by getting stuck in a lift. Um, one of the players posted a video afterwards showing them trying to force the door open, which is uh, not very nice, is it, Justin? <laughs> it's probably one of the biggest like fears of getting into a lift as well. Have you ever been stuck in a lift? I haven't. No, I'm touching wood here because I don't want to get stuck in a lift either because mm. no one wants to get stuck in a lift. They're horrible things. They're horrible things. But after a, after a win, it's probably better. But can you imagine how, how awful it would have been if they'd lost? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a very good point to be so depressing, <laughs> wouldn't it? My, um, my brother got stuck in a lift um, when he was about 12. He went on a school trip to <laughs> oh, Germany. God. And you think that's bad, Justin? It was about eight of them in this lift with uh, the teacher. Oh. So I feel sorry for the teacher who was stuck in a lift in Berlin <laughs> with, 12, uh, with eight 12-year-olds. All very claustrophobic. But yeah, not ideal. But it didn't look as bad in the uh, Portsmouth video. And look, they needed this win, didn't they, Justin? Despite you saying last week that uh, when we were reacting to my updated league table predictions on YouTube that you think Portsmouth are going down and you think they're shit and you hate Portsmouth. Oh God, I hate Portsmouth. Despicable. I'd never, ever go to Portsmouth unless I want to go to Isle, uh, the Isle of Wight, of course. Got to get the ferry. Um, <laughs> uh, no, look, I mean, you know, a team that's not won a game at all in the first nine games is always going to be... You've got to, you've got, to, you've got to be a good bet for going down, but look, they needed this win, as you, as you quite rightly said. 
you know, a tenth game without a win would have been catastrophic um, because you know the form obviously is poor. The confidence would have been down, and and the damage could well have been done points wise. Although the team, you know, they have drawn quite a few games, which has given them some a uh, you know, bit of a saving grace. But this this win needs to inject some life into them. It really does. They have come against a QPR team who in and around there, in you know, in amongst the bottom with them. So there is a bit of you know, just take it with a pinch of salt, but wins a win. Wins a win. Win is a win. It certainly is, Justin. But I think this is huge because you know things were bad when uh, Portsmouth fans were starting to question whether John Musinho was the man uh, to lead them forward. But that's exactly what they were doing after going so long without a win. And look, we've banged on a lot about how hard their fixtures were, but even when the fixtures started to get easier for the lack of a better term mm-hmm. they were still struggling so yeah. that that's why this win is so massive and I think the return of Callum Lang was a big part of that um, he got a goal and assist and they've sorely missed him because he's been their best attacker so far this season I want to give a shout out for Freddie Potts as well who got one of the goals he's the son of Steve Potts the West Ham legend a bit before my time but it's <laughs> his son um, who really impressed on loan last season at, uh, at Wickham um, and I, I thought there was a underrated bit of business uh, that Portsmouth did over over the summer. So, um, I mean, those two are fantastic in this game and Portsmouth in general were very on it. So a big win. And there's every chance they probably get going now, Justin, because they've got very winnable fixtures coming up all the way to December, really. Because yeah. as we've mentioned constantly, that tough running means that they've, pray, that they've played pretty much all of the top teams already. <laughs> so don't be surprised if Portsmouth start climbing the table from this point onwards, is what wow. I would say. Statement. Statement. Yeah, it's a statement. really a statement because, look, I know I keep going on about it, but the fixtures were ridiculous, Justin. They, yeah, they, they were tough fixtures. They were. You are absolutely right. But... Um, yeah, they, they, yeah okay, as, as I say, they got some draws on the board as well. But um, you know, the, the confidence takes a battery when you're losing games and when you're losing, and you're not winning games as well. You start to question things a lot, like you know, Portsmouth fans questioning John Massinho. Um And you are right; you know, the fixtures do ease up, and they have played a lot of the top teams um, already, so they can just put that put that at the back of their minds, just just go. But at the same time, like it's not as easy as that in a championship because, as we always say. Anyone can beat anyone in this league, and it shows. So I just don't think any game is winnable, um, or a guaranteed win, if you like. I mean, every game is winnable. Yeah, every, <laughs> literally every game is winnable. Literally winnable, but I mean, <laughs> as I followed up exactly after that, because I realised what I said, I said, I can't even remember what I said now, and I'm just going to look an absolute tit. But every game... <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's move on swiftly uh, before Justin digs a hole any deeper. Um, Justin, every so often I, I look at the championship table and I'm just surprised. I was surprised just before the international break to see QPR in the bottom three. I'm now even more surprised to see them bottom of the mm. table. Seven points from ten games explains it, but it's funny with QPR, isn't it? Because I don't think they've been that bad, but they're bottom of the league. It's very confusing. Yeah, I, I, I don't think they've been that bad either, but they've been losing games because they haven't been you know, making the right decisions. I think a good example is that penalty they gave away from uh, Morgan Fox. He had about 10 minutes to meet the ball and clear it, but he waited and waited and waited until committing a stupid foul. Um, and then you got Elias Chair as well. The game's at 1-0 for QPR. He tries to dink the keeper rather than you know, dink... Uh, um, you're taking the ball around him or any, anything, it was a good chance that should have been put away and he didn't. You know, it's these moments that QPR aren't seizing. You go back to the previous game against Derby where um, they switch off straight after kickoff and concede a second and just give themselves a lot of work to get him back into that game. There are moments that they're not quite firing at. Defensively, they're not quite firing either. There's just a lot they're not getting right, which is very basic to say. Um, but you look at them, compare them to last season, Every everything that was good about them last season, they haven't showed yet this season, which is, you know, it puts Sif Wentes under a lot of pressure. Yeah, the Marty party has got to that stage where everyone is being sick. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not going well, well at all. They, they, they've definitely not been the worst team in the league, they if you were to base everything on the eye test. I think we're both in agreement on that. I mean, they have lost four in a row now, but they have had more shots than the opposition in each of their last three. So... It's very strange, but things are clearly not going very well because, you know, four losses in a row is not great, whichever way you look at it. So I'm not really sure why it's gone 
so wrong all of a sudden. But an attack with Karamoke, Dembele and Elias Chet has the potential to be a top half attack in my eyes. And then defensively, they were excellent under Marty Sifuentes last season, weren't they? Now they're not, even though they have the same defenders. So it seems like a lot of QPR fans are starting to question Sifuentes, which is crazy after everything he accomplished last season and the fact they gave him a new contract last month but that's where things are at and I rather lazily assume that they will get better but get this the next five games are Coventry, Burnley, Sunderland, Middlesbrough and Leeds (laughs) bloody hell (laughs) very tricky but uh, things need to improve otherwise they could be more danger than than I think at the very least and um, Sunderland got a controversial 1-0 win away at Hull on Sunday afternoon. Um, let's talk about the goal, first of all, Justin. It was scored by Wilson Isidore, and it's a wonderful goal, which we will talk about more shortly. But it came after the referee, Bobby Madley, got in the way of a Hull corner. Um, what did you make of it, Justin? Yes, he gets in the way, but I think the decision-making... Um yeah, that led to who was dispos- dispossessed? Was it? Uh, yeah, it was Javier Simmons. Yeah, the, the, the decision making from Simmons to then get dispossessed, I think, probably deserves a little bit more criticism. He didn't have to croy fit. He didn't see the pass that he wanted, and therefore tried to turn and was robbed by the defender. And Inisador's got a long way to run with the ball. He's had to run sixty yards. Um, so I think blaming Madley solely for that goal uh, I think is really really harsh I, I, referees get in the way all the time it happens they want to be and have to be in amongst the players positioning for the corner it was a very natural position for a, uh, a referee to be in um, yes he could have maybe been a bit sharper about where the play was and where it was going but he doesn't know Simmons is going to be the recipient of that pass does he? I don't I think, think he even knows he's there exactly so I think it's a little bit harsh to be blaming Madley for that yeah yeah, I completely agree, Justin. I've got a lot of sympathy for the referee because he's tried to get out of the way, yeah. hasn't he? And he, he didn't know where Simmons was when he was behind him. So it's not like he was purposely blocking the ball, which is what a lot of people related to Hall seem to be basically acting like that was the case. I think Hall's protestations about the whole incident were very over the top. They were. Because Alfie Jones went mad at the referee after the goal, which I, I just... Don't, I don't think yeah. it's particularly fair. Think, As you say, a lot of distance has been covered yeah. between that moment well, and it. the goal. That's it. You can feel an injustice, sure, but at the end of the day, Isidore's had to run 60 yards uncontested. That's where yeah. you should be going, actually, I, I can I can be a little bit frustrated at the referee, but you bollock your defenders for leaving him in a one-on-one situation. That's not, that's not, yeah. that's poor, that's poor. Yeah, yeah. If you're mad at the referee, then you've also got to be just as mad at Simmons for not dealing with the ball better and whichever defender it was for not dealing with this at all. So I, I think it's unfortunate, but it's a pretty lame excuse. And um, I did enjoy Luco Nine saying after the game that he thought the referee's positioning was great. <laughs> He's such a shit ass. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a little tit, isn't he? But I love him. <laughs> um, very funny. Um, it's also worth saying Bobby Madley got in the way three times in this game. Not oh, just it's his time. fault then. He is the problem. <laughs> he is the problem. <laughs> He's got no spatial awareness whatsoever. That's the issue here. Um, he was not having much luck at all. One of them did obstruct Sunderland, so it evens it out a bit, Belly. I guess. Um, not sure Tim Bolton would agree with that sentiment just I tell you what Tim Volta is a very funny bloke he is. Yeah, when he is. you watch him on the sideline he is absolutely top class he's blockbuster stuff every time the camera pans to him he's doing something mad he's just, just losing he's just, his mind he's, he's an eccentric uncle isn't he <laughs> That's what he is. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. I just love him. I think I, I'd happily watch Hull. Volta um, Cam. Yeah, just have Volta Cam all the time. But <laughs> we need Hull on TV more often because I'm not completely sure about him as a manager, but he's very good entertainment value. Um, there, there was a handball shot for Hull in the first mm. half, which did look a bit mm, sketchy. Tim Volta was so livid that he hugged the fourth official. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you ever been so angry that you hugged someone out of frustration, Justin? Do you know, um, you, with a dog, do you get cute, cute aggression? Uh, yes, I think. Where you like, you love your dog that much, you, you ruffle them like 
almost aggressively because it's like, yeah. oh, George, I love you, I love you, you're you're, you're beautiful, you're wonderful. Yes, That's what Volta was doing. That's what Volta was doing. <laughs> Cute aggression it's before good. the fish. It's very good stuff. And <laughs> um, right now, we can give Wilson and Isidore some well-deserved praise because that was a beautiful goal, wasn't it, Justin? It was. When you consider the fact that he's had to sprint sixty yards with a man up his arse, and he's <laughs> he's so he's so <laughs> elegantly dinked the goalkeeper. Um, you know, just to do that under fatigue is very difficult. To do that tired is is, is a difficult thing. But he did that, and it, it was it was a wonderfully aesthetically pleasing goal. Uh, and as we were alluding to when we were discussing the the situation that got him in that one on one situation, he's had to run sixty yards so far. Uh, and again, just to be that composed at the final hurdle, uh, you see players really fluff those situations up where they try and take it around a goalkeeper for example and the legs just fail them uh, Abu Adams is a good a- example for Derby didn't he <laughs> isn't it where he's really sprinted 60 yeah. yards and he's completely cocked it up but Isidore didn't it was, it was a great run and finish Darren Bent was on the pondry for, pondry for this game and he did correctly point out that Isidore didn't really have the ball under control in the time that he's dribbling <laughs> because his touches, his touches were so off. <laughs> but um, it, it was kind of like he was sprinting and just accidentally kicking the ball at the same time. It was quite funny when you watch it back. But the athleticism was astonishing and to have the composure to finish the way he did after running that far is so impressive. And look, we've been calling for a long time now, Justin, for Sunderland to sign a striker. He looks like he is that man because three goals in four games now. I have been impressed with him, Justin. Have you? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you know, having Sunderland having a focal point is so important. Having a goal scorer, um, I, I think that's the main surprise here with with Sunderland this season. Is you know, just when you think that you they can't, they don't have a player to step up, and their inexperience will will we'll sort of catch up with them. It doesn't. They keep delivering, and that's remarkable. It's a remarkable question from Lebris, but also credit to the players that are doing it. And he said, "All." Oh, as I say, he's a focal point and he's he's doing what he needs to do. Yeah, he's on loan from Zenit St. Petersburg in Russia. Bit of a strange situation, actually, because he was on loan at Zenit last season. They signed him permanently this summer and a month later sent him out on loan to Sunderland. So not sure what the thinking is there, but if he keeps this up, Sunderland will be keen to hold on to him because he's been great, not just with scoring goals, but as you say, holding on to the ball just in causing problems for defenders. He looks like a real player. So, yeah, someone who's becoming increasingly valuable for Sunderland. And their back top of the league are the Black Cats. Hull have now suffered back-to-back losses. And I get the sense your prophecy of them winning three and losing three on a few occasions this season, Justin, might come true with them, but certainly one to monitor. Bristol City won 2-0 away at Middlesbrough in an emotional afternoon at the Riverside Stadium. Here's some three-word reviews for Bristol City. Phil on our Patreon says, Man- Cider Army. Uh, yeah, Bristol City's players held up a banner which said, Fly High Theo, after the game in memory of Liam Manning's son, who passed away not long after being born. Manning's having some time off uh, after that. So a very touching tribute there from the players and a great win for Bristol City. Have been drawing a lot of games recently, so they needed a win at some point. Didn't expect it against Middlesbrough, but fair play. <laughs> you say that, but Middlesbrough have this uncanny habit of giving or gifting op- opposition three points by not Justin delivering. Justin will get that. Yeah, we'll I know, I know, that. I know. Don't you worry. But I think, you know, the argument for Bristol City is they did run the look a, you know, a little bit in this game, but I think, you know, there's a lot of positives to take out of it. They're only taking the clean sheet back down to Bristol, but there was a lot of, uh, you know, quality individual performances. Jason Knight was bloody brilliant. I know he got two assists, but his drive and, you know, desire to, to press and win the ball and, and keep Bristol City playing and Pushing Middlesbrough back, I think, is a, is, a, is a key, you know, a key cog in in that team, and it was a key cog in the win here. Um, but they needed that; they absolutely needed it. They needed the confidence to breathe breathe through them because, um, you know, they, they draw a lot of games. They have a habit of letting themselves down, but they didn't in this game. You know, you mentioned individuals who stood out for Bristol City. Someone I'm really enjoying is Yu Hirakara, who's uh, the Japanese winger who joined in the summer. Uh, one of a number of Japanese players have come to the championship mm. in a recent months, actually, but he's been very enjoyable to watch. He's had a very bright start to life at Ashton Gate and is really becoming a favourite down there. He's very tricky, very creative. I like the look of him, Justin. What about you? 
Yeah, it, 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 well, you know, you've got Ohashi as well, who's really impressed at, uh, at Blackburn. Here, Carl was another one. You know, a lot of I think Bristol City recruited really well, and it's testament to taking a little bit of a risk going into a different market and uh, and dipping their toes in there. But here, Carl was delivering, and they've got they've got a really really nice balance to their attacking, um, you know, attacking quality. Mometi got a goal here, but he's a player who is a very tricky customer as well. So yeah, there's a lot of variation there for for Bristol City and here, Carl, as they delivered in this game. Long may that continue. Yeah, he's only on loan, so uh, that, he might be another one who uh, a championship club is hoping to get on a permanent basis at some point. But he's impressing quite a lot, so it wouldn't surprise me if there's a, a, a few other clubs having a look at him, actually. Our friends at Opta made a graphic this week, Justin, who's got the easiest and trickiest games coming up. Well, Bristol City apparently have the hardest. They've also had the kindest fixtures so far, apparently. Um, so interesting to see how they get on from this point, particularly without Liam Manning. Um, but yeah, something I just thought I'd bring up, Justin. I'm starting to think maybe we should just record something about Middlesbrough and let that play out each week, because we are just saying the same thing again and again, with yeah. them, aren't yeah. we? All together now. Middlesbrough can't put away their chances, can they? Um, it's the same thing again and again, and it's becoming a bit of a joke now, isn't it? People must think we've gone insane with the amount of times that we're just saying the same thing over and over with Middlesbrough. But it's it's another case where it's just happened again. Yeah, there's no point sort of treading on similar ground here. Uh, so I'll sort of move the conversation elsewhere. How is Michael Carrick not bold yet? <laughs> The man's hairline it, is... It must be pretty stressful, it's got to be said. Oh my God, it has to be. It's, it has to be. Uh, I think a, you know, a key moment in this game is Latte Laf missing a chance in the first half, one that he really should have put away, um, where he puts it right past the post where you should have got it on target at the very least. Um, there, you know, there's, there, there are those moments they're not seizing. And I think Carrick said after the game that they needed to find a killer instinct. Dude, they need to have found that six, seven months ago, eight months ago, 10 months ago. It's the same thing. We've been saying the same thing for the past year. And it's really hard to put that on Michael Carrick. But well, yeah, what's the what's the difference here? Do you need more technical coaches, you know, helping finishing sessions? I think that's really sort of um uh, you know, an easy sort of a assessment to make of it. But why aren't your team taking your chan- taking their chances? It's getting to a point it's ridiculous. And as I say, turn the conversation around. How is Michael Carrick not bold and grey yet? Do you just say dude? Yeah, I did. I did. I showed my age there a little bit. <laughs> sure, I like it when we're trying to be hip and I was down. Pa- I, was being, I was being passionate. I was in the moment. Yeah, it's just middle it side frustrates me. No, it's fine. It's fine, Justin. You don't need to explain yourself okay. to me. Yeah, um, I, I don't think this was Middlesbrough's best performance of the season. They, they, they've definitely had others where they have, you know, created a shed load of chances and not put them away. But th- this was certainly another example of them just being flimsy in front of goal because they certainly created enough just cannot put it away I know XG isn't everyone's cup of tea but just quickly it's got to be said Middlesbrough the highest XG in the league with quite a sizable gap on Leeds who Mm. have the next most and then they've only scored 10 goals from an XG of nearly 18 according to Opta and I've never known a team to underperform their XG like Middlesbrough are it's astonishing really it's it's almost getting to unprecedented levels of how much they are <laughs> underperforming in front of goal it's ridiculous and if they keep playing like they are surely they have to start scoring goals eventually it, it's that simple where they're playing well it's just in front of goal they're an absolute nightmare because Emmanuel Latilath he's, he's starting to become the main finger pointer here because he was scoring goals for fun at the end of last season and he's just missing so the, many. I, the, the latte laughing stock of the uh, final third. That's acceptable as far as puns go, <laughs> Justin Peach. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really know what else to say on Middlesbrough at this stage. I'm just aghast at how bad they are at taking their chances. It's really, really frustrating, but it's something that just seems to keep happening. And as we say, maybe it'll click at some point, Justin, but I, I just don't know if it will. Well, I, I I don't know what else to add it, uh, add to that because I say I just feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Um, they are the most frustrating team in the division by a country mile. I don't think, as you say, they're not at the best here, but they still missed really key chances. You feel that wasteful in front of goal consistently. You know what can you change? You start dropping players. Well, you know it seems like you know, starters miss miss chances, um, subs miss chances. It's just um, I don't really know where Michael Carrick goes from here. If this 
symptom keeps coming up, it's yeah, it's frustrating for us. It must be worse for Middlesbrough fans. Yeah, as you say, Carrick's hair. Um, and finally, Coventry have now lost four from the last five after being beaten one 0 away at Preston. Three word review for Preston. Seamus says another solid performance for Coventry. Cov boss says we're going down. Cal on our Patreon says Deepdale curse continues. Yeah, I'm not sure if you believe in bogey teams or not, Justin. But Coventry against Preston, it turns out, is a pretty incredible example. They haven't beaten Preston in the league since 2007, despite playing each other 22 times yeah. since then. They've never won at Deepdale in the league either. That's, that yeah, is, that's a bogey team. That is absolutely amazing, mm-hmm. isn't it? I, I can't think of any others which are on that kind of level, but maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, um, I don't think Coventry fans are letting Mark Robbins use that as an excuse because it's another loss for them and it led to him having an angry exchange with one or two Coventry fans after game and it pretty much sums up how frustrated everyone associated with Coventry City is right now Justin yeah you would be you would be because it's a, it's another game that's gone begging I think there were good moments from Coventry in this one but the, the, the blend consistently throughout the 90 minutes just wasn't there um, and I think the fans have every right to be frustrated I know there have been a lot of changes at the club that we spoke about before i.e. coaching changes and you know loss of experienced players um, that we don't need to sort of tread on old ground there but uh, I think that uh, does does play a role but also I think Mark Robbins is you know, I mean, he's got to step up a little bit and you know, call things out. The, the performances haven't been good enough and they're not enough. And I think uh, to be in a position where they are now, where they're 21st with eight points on the board, just isn't good enough for the amount of money they spent, unfortunately. You know, you've, as I say, like when you spend a lot of money in a championship, an expectation increases. You have to deliver against that expectation. Yeah, well, it increases whatever level you're at, doesn't it? I mean, you say Mark Robbins has got to call these things out. Maybe Mark Robbins has got to look in the mirror because there seems to be a growing divide amongst the Coventry fan base about him because you've got one side saying he's a legend, we need to back the team and just, you know, have faith in Mark Robbins. But then there's the other side, which seems to be a growing one where you've got people saying, guys, we've won four from 19 league games now. It's not just this season, it was the end of last yeah, season too, where uh, th- this this has been an issue for longer than just this season. I think, uh, I think earlier in the season, they were actually playing well while just not getting the results, but that's not the case anymore. And, and, and I mean, another thing you could say is, well, they're missing Ben Sheaf, but he's back in the team now for the past few games and things haven't improved. So where do Coventry go from here? I honestly don't know. Obviously, Mark Robbins has got credit in the bank, but we are just—are we just going to be saying this forever while they keep struggling? At what point does that credit run out? I think that's a really interesting question, Justin. When does that credit run out for Mark Robin? Mark Robbins, because who knows really? Um, What I do know is they've got QPR away on Tuesday night, which is such a huge game of football for both sides, isn't it? Particularly because Coventry haven't won an away game in seven months, by the way which is a, another pretty frightening stat from a Coventry perspective. Um, so, yeah, a, a lot needs to change at Coventry. Um, and I'm not sure they're getting to a stage where it looks like it's close, unfortunately, but we'll wait and see. Um, we haven't spoken much about Preston this season, Justin, because they've been a bit boring um, for the first couple of weeks of the season, but they've now got seven points from their last three games. Not conceded in that time either. And it looks like Paul Eckingbottom has finally got them going. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of positives to take uh, from their recent run. They've lost one in uh, the last six, which is which is great, and obviously won two of the last three. So there is some momentum building there, and I think the key thing for for Paul Heckingbottom is just is just building on the confidence that they've produced because they have been one of the worst sort of creative teams in the division in terms of putting you know, creating chances and, and putting those chances away. Defensively, they're starting to improve as well. I know Ryan Lowe does get a lot. Um, uh, for, you know, a lot of frustrations thrown towards him, but he did have a you know, defensively resilient team, or one of the better ones anyway in the division. Not well, the best, but certainly, certainly a positive. And I think Paul Hackingbottom sort of returning the team to that those sorts of principles is just about finding the, the balance at the other end of the pitch. But uh, you know, one nil away, at, um, no, sorry, one nil home at win at, uh, against Coventry it was a big one, and I think that yeah, it's just going to breed a lot of confidence in that team. Yeah, I did say a few weeks ago I was getting increasingly worried about them because they were playing pretty poorly. Results weren't great. They weren't terrible, though, but they were playing pretty poorly um, despite that. They have been so much better, though, and are actually playing some pretty nice football at times as well. Mads, uh, Mads Frokiai Jensen has a great game. 
Brian Lowe, who you were just mentioning there, just never seemed particularly convinced about him, but he's clearly got a lot of talent. It's just about getting the best out of him. And uh, Heckingbottom certainly seems like he's making some progress on that front. And Emma Reese is another one looking dangerous up front. So we're seeing promising signs with Preston. Not anything outstanding, but it's promising to say the very least. And hopefully they keep progressing and start climbing up the table. I mean, they've climbed up to a surprising amount already. But if they keep doing that, then uh, who knows? Who knows where Preston could take themselves this season? Justin, it's poll time. This is the part of the show where we give the listeners three questions on Twitter. Just want to get their thoughts on everything to do with the championship. So the first question we asked was this. Is it time for Coventry to get rid of Mark Robbins? Yes or no? I'd probably give him to the next uh, to, until the next international break. They make a decision then. So if things don't improve, then yes, get rid of him. But at the moment, I'll say no. Mm, interesting, interesting. Sixty nine percent of people said no. Thirty one percent said yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's very difficult with the Mark Robbins thing, isn't it? Because obviously they're massively underwhelming right now. But it's Mark Robbins, you know. That, that's that's the thing, isn't it? He, he's such a legend at Coventry that it makes it really difficult to be too harsh with him. And um, which of these teams do you think is the most likely to finish bottom of the championship this season? Cardiff, Plymouth, Portsmouth, QPR. Cardiff, Plymouth, Portsmouth, QPR. I I will I will continue my Portsmouth narrative that you've created around me. I'll say Portsmouth. <laughs> So needless. <laughs> yeah. So needless. Um, I mean, I did my updated league table predictions over the international break. I said Plymouth in that, so I'm obviously going to stick with Plymouth. Uh, 37% of people said Portsmouth. So oh, there you go. There you go. They all hate Portsmouth that, as well. Um, 28% of people said Plymouth. 20% said QPR. 15% said Cardiff. And finally, who would you rather fight? A chicken every day or an orangutan once a year? Well, I love orangutans. I'll go with a chicken every day. Fuck it. Because actually dinner is quite, actually quite dinner annoying, sorted though, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would, but actually dinner sorted. And, you know, if, if um, you know, if you AI... tell someone stop being a vegan. <laughs> yeah, I would. Uh, if AI, if I, uh, AI takes over the world and we all sort of drop into an apocalypse, then that's your meal sorted every day, isn't it? I just think it'd be really annoying. Think about on your wedding day, you've got to... So, sorry, love, uh, I'll get married to you in a sec. I've just got to fight a chicken, first of all. I think an orangutan. I could take an orangutan. I like orangutans. Though. They're nice. Yeah, but Endangered you, as this, well. This one thinks you're a dick because you've got to fight it every year. So A lot of people do, but I don't want to fight them. Well, it, it's the rules, unfortunately, this poll. <laughs> um, 70% of people said they would rather fight a chicken every day. 30% said an orangutan every year. And um, there we go, ladies and gents. Patreon subscribers, hang about. We've got the extended edition of the weekend show coming up, which we like to call Zamora Time. We'll be talking about a miss of the season contender, Messi v Ronaldo of the championship and me pissing off the whole of America. If you're not a Patreon subscriber, sign up to get Zamora Time every single Sunday. Head over to patreon.com forward slash second tier. Link is in the description of this episode, but it's just about time for us here on the second tier, ladies and gents. We'll be back again on Thursday, where we'll be reacting to all the midweek action from across the championship so we look forward to seeing you then for that but this has been the second tier podcast i've been ryan dilks i've been justin peach and a big thank you for listening